This is not the scale. These are about nine inches long, made from uh, magnesium alloy. So when they were ignited by a small fuse, they would burn for about 10 minutes at a very high temperature. They were essentially meant to start fires. They were feared for the fires they started. You didn't put them out with water from your bucket. And Alexander Plett was a policeman, metropolitan policeman in uh, South London. He said, I stopped a little boy and stuffed, stuffed his jersey. He had two live incendiary bombs that hadn't gone off. He said, don't take those, Governor, don't take them. I haven't got a souvenir. My mates have got some of these. And that was a common occurrence. My father talked uh, a great deal about going down to the bomb sites, trying to get bits of shrapnel. As far as I know, he never got hold of two live incendiary bombs. Francis Goddard of the Auxiliary Fire Service in Tottenham said, I was on my way to the shelter when suddenly this object came floating along the top of our house, came down very low, and I could only see a parachute and a rope hanging below it. So I jumped up to grab the rope, but it drifted up and it went over the embankment and it carried on down to the marshes where it blew up. I had nearly grabbed hold of a ruddy landmine. That is a ruddy landmine. These were actually magnetic shipping mines um, with adapted detonators. They were dropped by parachute. They caused colossal damage. Um, time to detonate above the ground, as opposed to the high explosive bombs that were meant to penetrate uh, into buildings. Uh, above the ground, the shock waves could destroy an entire street. Interesting, actually, because uh, British scientists had only recently uh, found a way to neutralize these magnetic shipping mines. Um, it was a, a, a system called degaussing, and it was actually saved enormous number of ships uh, at Dunkirk, because basically what, what degaussing was, was wiping um, the hull of the ship uh, with a copper coil. And that made it impervious to, uh, to, to these magnetic shipping mines. So the Germans now had a large stockpile of these uh, shipping mines. What were they gonna do with them? They turned them into um, these, floating bombs that floated down uh, on parachutes. And actually it's quite interesting also, it's worth, I, I now, when I'm walking down the street, uh, I tend to look at the street in a new way. If there's one house missing or two houses missing, that's probably a high explosive. Um, if there's a whole row missing, that's probably uh, a landmine. Um, as, the pop as the bombs came down, the population uh, took shelter. And um, they took their lead, of course, from this. Thomas Parkinson, who was a civilian in Kentish Town near here, said the worst part of the bombing was when the siren went. It would send a chill down your spine. Theresa Wilkinson, who was a, a warden in West Ham, said, I was an air raid warden, but I actually had no authority to make people take shelter. One night we were passing a block of flats and this man was standing outside. You should get into a shelter, uh, we said. And he told us what to do in no uncertain terms. So we left him standing there and we walked on. And when we came back, he was still outside that block of flats, but his head was about four steps further along. This is uh, a Topolsky uh, uh, sketch uh, of the tube because famously Londoners sheltered in the tubes. They'd sheltered in the tubes in the First World War, uh, actually, it wasn't, this wasn't the first time it had been done. But the thing was that the government didn't want the tubes to be used for shelter during the Second World War. They were worried about, well, really two things. First of all, they were worried about what they called, and I've, I've had a look at the cabinet papers about this, they called the deep shelter mentality. They were genuinely worried that once people basically descended down into these deep shelters, they would become antisocial troglodytes. They would become uh, shelter inhabitants who wouldn't want to come back up and live productive lives anymore. There was a genuine worry. This would create a, a new sort of underclass. Um, they also wanted to keep the tubes running. The tubes were running that were essential for the, for, for, for the running of London. And so the government was very keen to keep people out of the tubes. But the way things work, people took it on themselves to go down there. First of all, they bought tickets and just stayed down there overnight. Then they actually started forcing their way down uh, into tubes. This, this happened at Liverpool Street, it happened at Hoban. Uh, 
Um, and eventually the government decided they couldn't keep people out and tubes started being used. Actually only ever about 5% uh, of, of, of people were down in the tubes. Um, but at the same time, you know, they were, well, I mean, these people on the stairs would be who weren't regulars. So regular people would more likely have their, their place. In fact, there were, there were people who were known as dippers and dippers were a bit like touts. They would basically um, send people down to take the best spots and they would then sell those spots on to people uh, who, who would come down later on. There was a whole economy um, out of this. These people sitting on the steps, I mean, I can't imagine a more uncomfortable way to spend a night, um, but that would be the people who weren't the regular shelterers uh, in the tubes. But still, it wasn't comfortable. Having said that, Christabel Leighton Porter, uh, who funnily enough was a model for the Daily Mirror cartoon character Jane, who you might know of, she says, when the war was ending, a lot of old people were terribly distressed, wondering what they were going to do with their evenings. They thoroughly enjoyed their nights down the tube shelters. So even though the conditions were terrible, I mean, you know, there, there were maybe a couple of chemical toilets down. I mean, they really, they smelt and they were awful. But at the same time, there were a lot of very lonely people who didn't have community, um, mainly older people. And these people who you know, spent their war um, down there were quite loath to leave at the end of it because they'd shared a community for the first time in a long time. Um, Dori Silverman, who has worked for the Ministry of Information, said people from poor homes suffered more greatly than the middle classes. Middle class people probably had a garden and an Anderson shelter. This is an Anderson shelter. Now, I think Anderson shelters have had a, a bad press. I mean, you know, all, all they are, you can see they're corrugated iron. Um, you'd have a sort of layer of earth on top of them. Um, and they were in your garden and they're pretty flimsy, also pretty uncomfortable. You know, when it, when it, during winter, you know, you'd have your bunks up there. It was pretty uncomfortable in there either. But this was just, this was the, the, the theory of dispersal. The people would shelter, not in communal deep shelters, but in their own gardens, in their own areas. They actually were pretty tough. Um, the, the figures are that three out of four survived when a bomb fell 20 feet away, even if the shelter wasn't covered properly. So here you see, I mean, if there was a direct hit, if a, if a bomb landed directly on top of the Anderson, then clearly it wasn't going to survive. The people inside were not going to survive, but there's a very near miss. And you can see that the Anderson has, in effect, you know, it, it, it's done its job. And they often get a, a, a very bad press. People say that they weren't safe. I would argue with that. Um, this is the Morrison shelter. This came in slightly later during the Blitz in March 41. This, well, I mean, you can see it was a table tennis table that then became a shelter overnight. It was, the idea was that you would have your dinner. Uh, really, the idea was a lot of people weren't leaving the house. A lot of people weren't going into the garden. A lot of people weren't going into, the, the terrible surface shelters and, and, and the other things that, that were provided um, and were preferred to, to shelter either under the stairs uh, or under the, the dinner table. So the government effectively brought in a dinner table that you could shelter in. Um, and uh, it, was, it, it was solid. The trouble was obviously you had to be dug out once uh, if your house collapsed on top of it. Francis Goddard, who was in the fire services in Tottenham, he says, after a raid in the early hours of the morning, my wife and I went looking to see if there was any damage nearby. On the Tottenham High Road, a bomb had blown all the shop windows out and people were laying injured. We were the first ones there and I ran over to a man with no arm. He was a shop dummy. They all were from the tailor's window. This was the sort of event that took place during the Blitz. He then says, during another raid, we heard a lot of chickens kicking up a fuss. We went round to have a look at what was going on. It was a chicken run with a couple of dozen chickens in it and the blast had blown all the feathers off some of them. We saw these chickens running around without a feather left on them. We all had chicken dinners the next day and we didn't even have to pluck them. This is Broadcasting House. Now that, what you see there um, is uh, the damage that was caused by a bomb that 
hit they actually went through the roof and then down a few floors and and, and exploded uh, in October 1940 killed seven people and Bruce Belfridge was actually on air uh, at the time this is the BBC and this is Bruce Belfridge Tonight's talk and bulletin will be by Lord Lloyd, the Colonial Secretary. The story of recent naval successes in the Mediterranean is told in the Admiral. Now, I'd like to say that's an original recording. Actually, that was a recording that was made afterwards, but it reflects precisely what happened at the time. Belfridge did indeed just carry on reading the news. One particular event that always sticks in my mind is the bombing of the Café de Paris uh, in March 1941. And the Café de Paris was in, uh, well, still actually, funny enough, I think it closed down about a month ago uh, for good. But it was in uh, Leicester Square or just off Leicester Square. Um, and it's an extraordinary bombing because it's, it, it was considered safe. It was uh, an underground shelter. It was underground. Um, and one present there was a man we've already come across, Ballard Barclay. Uh, he was an actor who at the time was a special constable. He actually was the major in 40 Towers many years later. You'll probably remember him as that. Um, that's him uh, at a younger age with these strange red lines across him. I'm afraid I don't know what they are. Um, this is the Cafe de Paris. You can see there, um, that's the, the, the dance floor. And there you can see the band playing at the front. This is what Bernard Barclay said. He said, the most horrifying sight I saw was the Cafe de Paris in London in March 41. The reason it was such a horror was because it was reckoned to be a safe place. It's underground. It was registered by Westminster Borough Council as being safe. But they were dead unlucky in that the bomb entered a ventilator shaft at the top of the building and came right down the shaft and burst on the dance floor in front of the band led by Ken Snake Hips Johnson, a wonderful musician. He was killed instantly. I went into this place, I saw people sitting at tables, quite naturally, dead. Dressed beautifully without a mark on them, dead. That's Ken Snake Hips Johnson from Guyana, um, a very talented musician who'd come to Britain uh, shortly before. Um, this is his version of Tuxedo Junction. <laughs> And that's the Café de Paris after the bombing. Uh, in all, about 43,000 people were killed during the Blitz, which though a very large figure, was actually much smaller than had been anticipated. Quite simply, the great fear before the war was that bombing would kill literally millions of people. Um, in November, 1932, Stanley Baldwin told Parliament, he said, I think it is well also for the man in the street to realize that there is no power on earth that can protect him from being bombed. Whatever people may tell him, the bomber will always get through. It's famous that Baldwin saying the bomber will always get through. That was the general belief. Baldwin went further. He predicted that when the next war came, European civilization would be entirely wiped out. Now, the lessons they were taking were actually from the First World War, because, you know, at the beginning of the First World War, bombers, what did bombers do? The bombers hadn't, there were no bombs attached to planes. They started by throwing darts called flechettes over the side. That was in 1914. By 1918, they were carrying out large, the British were carrying out large raids on Germany and the Zeppelins were, were, were raiding London, uh, were raiding Britain, and the Gotha bombers were raiding Britain. So in just four years, they'd gone from absolutely nothing, a standing start, to large scale strategic bombing raids. And the belief was that these would get more and more and more serious. And as soon as war was declared, uh, at the start of the, the next war, the first uh, people to get their blow in would basically destroy uh, enemy cities. H.G. Wells had written a book to this effect. And in 1938, a year before the outbreak of war, the air staff, the British air staff had predicted half a million dead in the first two months of war. That was their prediction in 38. 
half a million dead in the first two months of war. But when the Blitz actually came, the major problem wasn't death. The major problem was homelessness. People who had taken shelter were bombed out of their houses. And the government just hadn't anticipated this. The, the result became known as the crisis of London in September. Of the problem is very well illustrated by a, a case that I found of a woman called Ida Rodway. This is um, an Old Bailey murder trial. Ida and Joseph Rodway were a devoted couple, devoted old couple in their 70s. They were living in Hackney. Joseph was senile, becoming senile. Um, Ida uh, was looking after him. They were bombed out of their house in early October 1940. They had very little money. They now had no access to money. Their clothes and their possessions were all in their bombed house. They couldn't get in. They had no idea of where to go for any help. So for a time, the first thing they did, they went uh, to a rest center where they were only allowed to stay for a, a night or two. They then went to Ida's sister where they slept on her kitchen floor. Joseph had no idea where he was. Uh, Ida became more and more desperate. And she contemplated killing herself, decided that would be unfair on Joseph. So what she did the next morning, she every morning she would bring him a morning cup of tea. So she made him a cup of tea and then she slit his throat and she killed him. And then she basically went outside and handed herself in to uh, a, a policeman. She was tried at the Old Bailey um, and uh, you can basically see that they were so keen not to convict. I mean, the, the penalty for a murder was, was a death sentence. They were so keen not to convict her that they found her guilty by way of insanity, which meant that she went to Broadmoor, which would, um, took women in those days, uh, uh, doesn't anymore, um, where she died in 1946. But it's a tragedy based entirely on the situation, the, the, the situation at the time. Um, and this was the man who brought order to London when homelessness threatened to get out of hand in 1940. This is a man called Henry Willink, who's pretty much a forgotten figure now. Um, he became the health minister afterwards, after this. But at this point, he was the man who was basically made a, a kind of czar. He was put in charge of this situation. Um, and it was his job to make sure cases like Ida Rodway simply didn't happen again. And so what he did, he started to make replacement housing available on a large scale. He organized large scale repairs of houses that were damaged. He ensured there would be just one place to go for anybody who needed necessities, who needed clothes, who needed food, who needed um, money. All of the things that people needed when they were bombed out. They, uh, initially, they had to go to about seven or eight different places. They simply didn't know what to do, particularly people in, in the Rodway situation. And then, Crucially, he removed the poor law stigma that was making claimants feel more like really Dickensian beggars than victims of strategic bombing. He introduced benefits, introduced information centers and social workers who would deal with individual cases. In other words, he was paving the way for the welfare state. And, but it's worth bearing in mind, he was a conservative uh, member of parliament. Come back to this. Then came the rebuilding the Blitz offered the chance to replace slums, outdated buildings with superior replacements. Now this is Coventry's civic architect, a man called Donald Gibson. Now Gibson, before the war, had drawn up a plan to rebuild Coventry. Now Coventry was a very beautiful medieval town, actually, or city, um, the center anyway. And so not surprisingly, uh, his plans were knocked back because it would involve ripping up a lot of beautiful Coventry. Um, but then uh, in November 1940, the Luftwaffe did the job for him, basically ripped up um, the center of, uh, of, of Coventry. These were the plans. These were his plans for um, Coventry on his drawing board, or on his board, whatever you call it. Um, and after the war, he was able to, to rebuild. And there's a very moving, there's a very touching BBC home service program from, I think it's 1941, maybe 42, um, where people, they do vox pops, they go out into the street in Coventry and they ask people, what do you want 
from, from your city when it's rebuilt. And people are very modest in they say we'd like, uh, we'd like a house that's easier to clean. We'd like uh, shops where we don't have to go all over town to different shops where we can get everything in one place. Um, we'd like refrigerate for you know, place you know, a way to keep our food cold you know it, it's all very very uh, uh, so I think it's 41 I think it's a, you know it's a, this is recordings that are done even at a time when the war is still going very very badly for for, for, for Britain it looks like Britain is going to lose and yet these people are talking very positively um, with great enthusiasm about that what they want from the post-war world. So it seems that morale was capable of surviving even the bleakest of the Blitz and Coventry was pretty bleak. I mean, the center was completely destroyed. Um, so we come on to the next question. How did people really behave during the Blitz? Was, was the famous Blitz spirit a myth? Well, of course, much is made of Blitz spirit. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of the cheerful men and women who got on with their lives and wouldn't let anything get them down. We were sort of whistling, we'll meet again as they walked to work over broken glass, shaking their fists at bloody Adolf. To what a degree was that true? Well, for me, the defining story is a woman called Joan Varley, uh, who I was very lucky to meet when she was in her 90s. She was a young woman at the time, uh, in 1940, living in London. And she remembered smoking on the top deck of the bus um, back in the days when you could do that one evening. She was on her way, um, she was on a bus going through Westminster. Uh, and she said she was on the top, there was only one other person up there at the front, um, a complete stranger. And they heard a bomb or a stick of bombs coming down. Uh, and the driver obviously heard it as well because he veered off the path and um, uh, went out of the way and the bombs exploded elsewhere and the driver got back onto, onto the route. And she said that as they were driving along, well, let's hear what she said. But the interesting thing was that of course we were driving into the explosion, didn't know the driver was actually going to be able to avoid them. And the man at the top of the bus came and uh, walked down the bus and sat on my seat next to me and we held hands. Now the odd thing was that no, neither of us spoke a word. From beginning to end, neither of us spoke a word. And once we were through the uh, bomb area, got back onto the route, he then moved back to the front seat without a word being said. That is blitz spirit. That is totally organic, instinctive, Blitz spirit, people being brought together by the danger, by the fear. Um, so it didn't, at its basic level, it didn't need to be fostered or created by the authorities. Now, clearly, a lot of that did go on. You know, London can take it, all of the propaganda, um, a lot of it angled towards the Americans, but, you know, for, for British consumption as well. Um, but at its most basic, Bit spirit, I don't think, um, was a myth. Um, and of course, well, it, it makes sense it wasn't because suddenly people had all this in common. Suddenly people were sharing danger, they were sharing things they'd never shared before. They were empathizing with each other for the first time ever for a lot of these people. Um, there, were those, there were people who enjoyed it. My father always talked about where he was eight years old. So that's probably why he enjoyed it. Uh, rather like hope, the film, Hope and Glory. Um, Alfred Senschel, who was a, a fireman in London, said the Blitz brought an air of excitement that nobody experienced in everyday life. Everyday life is humdrum, you go to work, you come home. To me, it was out of this world. I certainly wouldn't say that he was typical. I'd say that's probably quite an extreme reaction. But still, there is somebody telling it as they remembered it. Um, uh, Joy Steinke was a welfare advisor with London County Council Rest Centre Service. She said, as soon as the all clear went, you had the wardens and the firemen bringing all these people into the rest centres. They were in a pretty terrible state covered in bomb dust. You didn't know who was a street market person, who was from the posh flats. They were all reduced down. And this I think was the reason for the camaraderie of the Blitz. So she's putting it there another way. And then of course, there were many people who didn't experience the camaraderie. I came across somebody who said that they had seen 
somebody, friend of theirs, wearing a, a, a badge which said, I don't care about your bomb. Well, you know, makes its point. Um, and then Alfred Pryor, who's a stretcher bearer with West Ham Civil Defence, he said, outside Stratford Town Hall, they used to put a list of casualties for London for the previous 24 hours. I was a stretcher bearer with West Ham Civil Defence, and many a time I'd had more casualties through my hands alone than were supposed to have come through the because we're designed to keep the morale of the public up. If people had seen the real numbers, there'd have been trouble. And Marie Price, who was a civilian in Liverpool, says, I tell you something, the people where I lived would have surrendered overnight if they could have. People walking out of the town to escape the bombing would have surrendered overnight. So I suppose what I'm saying is there was no one story. And of course there wasn't, because there never is. Um, the Blitz was unprecedented. It was terrifying if you were wounded. If you lost family, friends, your house, your possessions, then this period was quite simply a living hell and nobody will ever convince you that it was anything else. But what the Blitz certainly did was to take people to extremes of existence. It could bring out the best and the worst in people and sometimes both at the same time. It was an extraordinary story I found, uh, a man called Wally Thompson, he was a lifelong criminal. Um, and what he used to do, people, criminals found opportunities during the Blitz. And what Wally Thompson did, he and his gang, he had a little gang of four people, uh, and they would steal a van and they would take that van out during a raid and they would go into somewhere that they'd staked out already and they would steal a safe. They would put the safe in the van and they'd take it away and they'd open it at their leisure. That was their modus operandi. Um, and one day, they did that, they, they drove the van in a raid, they drove the van up to, to uh, near London Bridge, parked up, went into a warehouse, pulled out the safe, the four of them were manhandling the safe when a bomb dropped nearby, threw them all up in the air, threw the safe up in the air. They decided, right, that's it, that's our, that's our night. We, they were all right, but we're, they're gonna go. So they started to go. One of them, whose name in the book is Spider, presumably not his real name, saw uh, a girl, in a third floor window or a young woman in a third floor window who was obviously in trouble and there was a, a fire raging. He was a cat burglar. What he did for a living was shimmy up drain pipes. So up he went and he basically struggled up, managed to get her in his arms, was starting to come down again when a fire engine came along. Fire engine had a policeman because policemen used to go along to, to incidents, put up its ladder, brought Spider and the girl down. The policeman said to Spider, congratulations, you've saved this woman's life. Can I have your name, please, your address? So I'd like to recommend you for some kind of an award. The last thing Spider wanted was to have his name taken by the police because the safe was still sitting uh, a little way away. And he went, they all went. The point of that story is you could go from being a villain, from stealing a safe, saving a life in the flash of a bomb. That was the intensity of the period. Now the increased opportunity, the blackout, the lack of police, all this meant that the Blitz saw a significant increase in crime. Um, Billy Hill, who was later to be known as the king of the underworld in London, he called the Blitz the golden age of crime. And police figures actually show an increase, significant increase. In London in 1941, there were 5,000 more arrests and 5,000 more indictable offences than there had been in 1939. And it's not surprising, is it? There was just more opportunity. If you look at the, the, the blackout, the bombed out houses. I mean, looting was right. There's a very thin line between recycling and looting. I mean, people, you know, houses that were bombed out, people would sometimes be walking past and see, you know, the, the people inside would had been killed or had moved away. They, you know, there would be a book there, strictly speaking, if you were take any, taking anything, that was, that was looting. And you, you could have a, a, a very, very heavy sentence. The people did. Um, particularly appalling example of looting. Ballard Barclay again says there was looting going on that night at the Cafe de Paris. This was one of the most awful things. One hears a lot about the bravery and the good things that happened during the Blitz, but there were also some very nasty people, some very nasty things that happened. Some of the looters in the Café de Paris cut the people's fingers off to get the rings. And that to me was the most awful thing. It was impossible with so many dead, so many injured, 
the firemen and wardens and police everywhere. Impossible to know who was who, and it was very easy to cut away a finger here, snap off a necklace there. And all sorts of new laws uh, came into force uh, during the Blitz. These were called wartime regulations. Um, they concerned food, lighting, currency, petrol, all sorts of areas of life, which meant that ordinary people were suddenly being summoned to court where they were receiving criminal convictions for lives and had no idea uh, had even become crimes. This was strict liability. Um, things like owning a car radio, because a car radio could be a transmitter, a spy could use, owning a light colored car, because that could be seen from above, uh, buying an unweighed chicken, um, a newly married couple, they moved into a new house. They literally stepped into the new house, walked upstairs, turned on a light, was seen by a policeman and they were up in court. They hadn't even had time to, to put up curtains yet. They literally just turned the light on in the house they'd just walked into. Um, so the bottom line was the Blitz was a time of intensity. It shocked people out of their rhythms. It encouraged unaccustomed good behavior, people working together, people volunteering on a massive scale, um, and unaccustomed bad behavior, sometimes from the same individual. People took risks they'd never taken before in tiny little ways. Women going into pubs on their own, not something that was really done before. Um, in bigger ways, Ronald Blythe's a wonderful writer. I spoke to him. Um, uh, he said, the Blitz was a time when inhibitions disappeared. I don't think things were better then, but there was a huge amount of adventure, excitement and romance because it was a breaking down of conventions. London, he said, was full of foreigners and people behaved amazingly. It was a permissive period that was more secret than the 1960s and never quite admitted. And I spoke to a woman who told me about her mother. Her mother was a very straight-laced woman who, her husband was in the services. He was, uh, I think, in um, North Africa. Uh, and so she was on her own at that time in, in London. And she met a man from one of the ministries who was from Scotland. He had a wife up in Scotland, but he'd come down to London. And they started a relationship. And it was a relationship that lasted for the course of the war with the understanding that it was not going to last beyond the war. It was something that was known. It actually had a name at the time, a wartime marriage out of convenience. It was sort of the, I don't know, the relationship, the sexual uh, equivalent of powdered egg. It was something that was only for the duration. And it was completely understood that these people would be together and loyal to each other in a relationship and then it would end and they wouldn't see each other again and they go back to their original lives. I often wonder if that's not what Noel Coward is writing about in Brief Encounter. And the fact seems to be that this was a time when many boundaries shifted. This is the cover of a freely available magazine uh, called London Life in May 1941. It's an extraordinary magazine and it's you know, you could get it on the newsstand and it's basically a, a fetish magazine. Um, I'm sure no one here had a subscription back then. Um, so people believe, behaved in, in, in all sorts of surprising, unanticipated, unaccustomed ways. Of course they did, because they might be dead tomorrow. The old rules simply didn't apply. It was a, a remarkable time socially. Uh, and, and, and look at the, some of the social changes that are taking place. When you had evacuation, let's leave this picture. I mean, it's a lovely picture, but we don't need it for too long. You had evacuation, um, which was bringing people together. Uh, people who'd never met each other before, had never had any chance to empathize with each other before. Hilda Cripps uh, was a civilian in Essex in Great Wakering. She said, my next door neighbor took in two little boys and their little sister from London. And as soon as she started to prepare a meal, they would go and sit on the doorstep. They weren't accustomed to sitting around a table. Tremendous change in those children's lives. And when they went for a walk down on the farm, one of the boys was horrified. Ugh, he didn't like seeing milk coming out of dirty cows. And after a while, the children changed. They became very different. They sat at table and became better. No, 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 I shouldn't say that, should I? That was how she put it. Um, so you had these people from different communities um, meeting I mean, this happened to a degree amongst the men during the First World War, but not amongst civilians. Um, women's roles, ideas were changing. Here we have a couple of uh, women changing uh, 
attire. Um, Goya Steinke again uh, says women were suddenly going out to work. A lot of them worked in munitions factories. But my boss's secretary had been to university, which was something in those days. And she never wore stockings, summer or winter, bare legs. She was an out and out labor person. And she told me that everything on the earth should belong to the people. I'd never heard this. Politics, I didn't know what politics were. She said that water, electricity, gas, all this should belong to the people. She was so passionate and I was a bit scared of her. So people again, and expanding their horizons and working women doing jobs, frankly, you know, they, they hadn't done before. Um, rationing again was equaling out people's experiences. Um, Francis Goddard says everybody had their crafty ways of getting extra food, black market food was the only way you could survive. My wife was working in a restaurant that had really good food, salmon, pheasants, turkeys, steaks, roasts, and she would bring it all back in her knickers. I had some fine meals at three o'clock in the morning. I'd be in bed, she'd come home and wake me up and she'd empty her purse out and pour out the tips and say, oh, I've had a good night tonight. I've collected over three quid. And out would come a piece of tissue paper. She'd undo it and there'd be two nice pieces of cold cooked steak and we'd sit there and eat them. Or it might be a piece of salmon or some tasty sweet. She might bring out a piece of great, great big piece of chocolate. And we'd laugh and I'd say, I hope you haven't worked too hard. I hope you haven't been sweating too much. So the fact is the people were brought together who had never come into meaningful contact before. And it made criminals of people who'd never even thought of breaking the law. People were wearing the same clothes. They were eating the same food. They were taking shelter together. Working class children were evacuated into middle class homes. Women were doing what had been men's work. Legislation was guaranteeing factory work as a minimum wage because it was now for the first time, let's be honest, in the interest of the authorities that the workers were well taken care of. Everybody was in the same boat to a greater degree. Um, they, people, the, the munitions factories had to work. Um, they, they had to produce munitions. The, the, the soldiers had to fight. It was in the interests of the authorities to, to take care of these people and in the factories, better conditions. Um, people had better protection. Wages went way up. Things were changing. And even in the cabinet, you saw, you know, people like Lord Halifax. I've seen, you know, they, 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 they were talking about post-war aims, even in 1940. And Halifax was saying, we are going to have to alter the way we treat people in the future. It's fascinating to see this happening as early as 1940. So the scene was clearly set for the beverage report of 42. Um, but it wasn't political ideology that was moving this agenda. It was necessity. The man we've seen, the man who brought order to London was Henry Willink, the way he was being paid for the welfare state by a conservative MP. Similar, Rab Butler began his move at this point um, towards free education for all, for the Education Act of 1944, the only reason my father went to university. Again, Butler was a conservative. It was a time for the country to take stock of what was happening, make things better. Uh, it didn't matter where you came from on the political spectrum. This was, this was pragmatism. Um, and as I say, people had this new importance. They were volunteering on this huge scale. I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, they were in physical danger. They were working in factories. They were in the armed forces. They had this new stake in society. So in the end, the government had to give them, I say what they wanted, something close to what they, they were asking for. Um, and that goes from sheltering in the underground allowing them to trek out of cities. This is a lot of, what a lot of people did. It shows how tough people were back then. In cities like Southampton, um, lots of different places around Britain, when the bombs came down and people didn't have adequate shelters, uh, they left the town. They just, they left and they slept outside in the countryside, um, in the fields and, 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 and in the hedgeways. And the government tried to stop this, uh, but, you know, what, what, what were they going to do? The people would, were trying to be safe and they were coming back in next day to, to work in the factories and to, to, to do their jobs. It just shows you how tough people, people were back then. Because a lot of people, I think it's worth remembering, people, you know, people, the country had come out of a depression. People were tough, people were used to terrible conditions already. Um, and and they, they were used to putting up with a lot. Uh, so it was it tended to be a matter of degree um, during the Brits. But the point was, because the government were 
changing the, the way they treated people, the relationship between government and people was changing. So this was a complex period. It was dark and it was light. And much of how you viewed this period depends or depended on your own personal experience. So let's get on to that hoary, dangerous question. How can we compare that extraordinary period um, with today? Well, let's be careful about drawing too many similarities. These are very, we're talking about two very, very different times. And say in the thirties, um, there's a big and very obvious difference, first of all, in the nature of the danger. Um, the danger was coming from bombs dropped by aircraft. So the way to stay sta safe in 1940-41 was to take shelter amongst other people. Uh, over the last year, the danger has been a virus spread by other people. The way to stay safe, as the government has told us, is to stay away from other people. So th let's face it, that's a pretty big difference. But there are similarities. Um, the amount of volunteerism that we saw then, that was the word given to it, and that we are seeing now. Um, I had my jab yesterday, as I, I said, uh, and Anthony said, the volunteers running that center were at, I had it in um, uh, the wreck uh, on um, Fleet Road. The volunteers were remarkable. I mean, it was so beautifully coordinated, like a ballet, it was so, it ran so perfectly. Um, in 1940-41, who, who was volunteering? Members of the ARP, the Air Raid Precautions, who ran the shelters, who policed the streets, who had to know where everybody lived, who understood the regulations, organized the stretcher parties. You had the Women's Voluntary Service, who did a staggering number of functions, from staffing the rest centers we've spoken about, to driving ambulances, mobile, running the mobile canteens, picking rose hips because they were full of vitamin C, um, citizens' advice bureaus. Uh, they'd actually got going slightly before the war, but this is when they came into their own. Um, the Home Guard, obviously, started off as local defense volunteers, but Churchill didn't like the name, they became the Home Guard. The Red Cross, the fire service. Um, it's an interesting question as well. The, 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 the psychology behind all this volunteering, um, you know, partly it was, you know, people who wanted to help, the, the, the greater empathy, but there was also a large element of peer pressure. Uh, and people feeling guilty if they weren't volunteering, people um, being made to feel guilty, uh, to the point that actually at some points it became difficult to be able to find something to volunteer to do because people were so keen to, to, to offer their services. Similarities, rumor, lots of rumors and speculations during this period, um, about a lot of them about spies and fifth columns and um, a particularly good one I read about the other day about the Germans dropping tuberculosis carrying um, starlings. Um, and we have plenty of false rumors running around uh, at the moment and over the last year. Um, I remember one in at Christmas that NHS staff were becoming sick from taking the vaccine. Uh, you know, people are people um, and they will spread rumors. Um, one thing I've noticed very evident during the Blitz and throughout the war was the way people identified themselves by their attitude to the rules, the way they behaved. Some people, you know, they, they very much identified themselves as people who obeyed all the rules, gas masks, blackouts, food. Whereas some people identified themselves as rule breakers, skeptics, not carrying their masks, subverting the rules as a kind of matter of principle. Does that ring any bells for, for now? Um, Similarly, there are many people uh, during the Blitz who snitched on their neighbors, who told on their neighbors, um, who were breaking rules, lots of that going on. And of course, there still is. Queuing, queuing, uh, I think it's always been a pastime, but you know, during the Blitz, when people saw a queue outside a butcher's or a fishmonger's or a grocer's, um, they often joined that queue, just as a matter of course, because there's probably something good at the end of it, even if it's you know, something off the ration, like whale meat. Um, you know, treat like whale meat. Um, and clearly we've got used to uh, queuing a lot more. I'm not, I'm not saying we necessarily join a queue when we see it anymore, but we're certainly used now to joining queues for food, which is something that we wouldn't have done a, a year ago. Um, here's another thing. Many of the wartime generation, all their lives retained a frugality. I saw this described the other day. Somebody said, 
you know, people would say, that generation would say, with, totally without irony, about a coat or a rug, yep, this is, this is good, this will see me out. Um, and the next generation along, and subsequent generations, um, you know, the never had it so good generation, kind of rebelled against that. Things became disposable and it was a sign of, of prosperity and civilization to be able to throw things away. And I wonder if we're not now returning at the same level, but returning to a, a, a more, a throwing these ideas. Here's one that I do think is, is, is uh, has something to it. Uh, in the 40s, there was a sense that the end of the bombing, more particularly the end of the war, would bring a very sudden reversion to a pre war normality. You know, they were going to sort of revert to 1938. Um, everything was going to go back to the way it was. And of course, it didn't, and it couldn't. And I think there's also been a kind of a sense that once the vaccine is really here and taken over, everything can go back to how it was last February. And again, you know, we, our, our, how, how, what will things be? What will the terrible phrase, the new normal be? Um, here's an odd one. Many people responded to the Blitz by doing nothing at all. A mass observation, which was the this wonderful social uh, observation um, unit, sent people into shelters to look at their behavior, uh, and particularly in Tilbury shelter, which is a horrible, great big uh, shelter in London. They would watch huge numbers of people just staring into space for hours on end, day after day after day. We've been encouraged by uh, just to stay in, uh, and I suppose uh, some of us have ended up in a habit of doing not very much, I don't know. Here's a difference. There was a pressure, I think, to show the right facade during the Blitz, to put on a, a, a brave face, even if that's not how you felt. Uh, and it may well have encouraged people, you know, putting on that facade may have encouraged some people to be stronger than they might otherwise have been. Uh, or it might have driven people to the edge um, who couldn't admit their true feelings. Um, I think nowadays it's certainly a lot more acceptable to admit how you're really feeling. But again, I don't, good thing, bad thing, I assume it's a good thing, but maybe there was something in the fact that, you know, a lot of people had to pretend during the Blitz and it actually kind of got them through. Um, and here's another difference. The Blitz, as I touched on there, was a first sexual revolution. I really think it was. Um, I really can't imagine that this period, this last year, has been a sexual revolution in any way at all. Um, although, if you know better, I'm very happy to be corrected. So um, there we are. That's those are my thoughts, um, and I'm happy. I mean, I'm sorry. I've gone on rather long. I didn't think it was. I was going to be quite so long-winded, um, but I'm happy to take questions or what, anything. Right. Well, thanks very much, uh, Joshua. That's that's a, a brilliant sort of tour de table of. Um, the events and um, social relations and so on that pertained at the time of the Blitz. Um, I'm sure people will have questions about this. So I suggest people start putting their questions in the, in the chat now and we'll read them out. But before we get on to that, and just to divert away from the Blitz itself for a minute and we'll come back to it, I just wanted to ask a bit about you. Oh yeah. I, I mentioned that you started life, or not life, but perhaps working life, as a barrister. And then mm. we went through a series mm. of sort of evolutions and have ended up as a, as a historian yeah. and other things. I mean, what, what took you down that path? So I, start, I was a criminal barrister, so I was interested uh, back then in people's stories. That's never changed. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, doing quite nicely. Um, and I'd always, all the time that I was um, working as a barrister, I was doing a lot of amateur theatre and taking plays every year to the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, and I decided just for fun to uh, apply to a couple of drama schools, uh, Rada and Lambda, to see if I was good enough to get in. I didn't intend to go. And then when I did get into to Lambda, I just thought, you know, I didn't want to, I knew so many from, from the bar 
I, I knew so many sort of frustrated barristers who, you know, would get drunk on a Friday night and say, I used to play the guitar or I used to do this or that, but I didn't really, I just thought, well, why don't you do it? So, you know, go off and see, uh, see, see if, how you do and see if you're good enough. And so I, I did. Um, and then I started writing and I wrote a play, which got put on, and then some BBC radio plays. And then I started writing history which has always, always been my um, passion. And I got, you know, I got a, 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 back in 2008, I think it was, I got a, a contract, which I'm sure starting off, I wouldn't do now. And suddenly I was off and I was writing. And so the acting just sort of, you know, I, that was what I was doing. And um, uh, I haven't sort of, I haven't looked back. I, mean, I've, I, I look back every day, but, but, it's that's what I, I do now, and that's what I. Um, it's always history has always been my passion, and and now I can make a living out of it, and I'm very lucky. Um, so so yeah, so that's that's in a nutshell where I've been. And why wars is a particular interest? Well, do you know the funny thing is, <clears throat> I'm honest with you. I, first of all, the the first thing I wrote was the Blitz. I, I, I suppose because my father's my father had lived through it. My father was obsessed by the by the, the, the Second World War. And, you know, when I was young, we used to listen to Churchill speeches. We used to listen to Al Bowley. We used to, you know, I grew up partly in the thirties and forties. So that was an obvious, you know, that was what my way in. Actually, in, in many ways, I'm more interested in social history than um, the military history per se. Uh, uh, so a lot of my books, even though they're on a kind of military topic. I mean, you'll see, I mean, the, the Blitz, for example, you could say it's a military topic. It's, it's the bombing of, 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 of the United Kingdom. But actually, almost everything I've spoken about today is really social history. Um, so, so I, you know, I'm always drawn towards social history. Um, and I've done a couple of um, radio documentaries for Radio 4 where they allow me to go off and do weird subjects like Peter Ackman, Slum Landlord, or the most expensive stamp that's ever sold and, and these odd topics that I wouldn't be commissioned to write books about, but I can do for radio. So I have, you know, I, my interests aren't just, it's not just war, um, but those are, you know, most of the books. So, so when I did the, the Dunkirk book of the film, you know, a lot of that again is how the soldiers lived. Why the, why, how, you know, the, the, the background of the soldiers who ended up fighting against each other at Dunkirk, you know, why, why uh, young Germans were, were, were the brainwashed Nazis that they were, who the young British soldiers were. So I always try and bring an, an element, a sort of unmilitary element in, even when I'm writing about military topics. That's terrific, thank you. Um, I think we'll start looking through some of the questions that people have put up. And I just, just to make the observation, I don't know if there's anybody around here who actually has any recollections of the Blitz or any period of the war themselves, or perhaps they do at second hand from parents. So if anybody particularly wants to speak about that, we'll, we'll unmute you a bit later on when we got through the questions. And uh, if you have some reminiscences, that, that would be really good to hear. Um, but just looking through what people have written. Um, the first question is one that sort of struck me as being um, interesting in a way that, you know, the Blitz have just followed the Battle of Britain. Mm. which essentially uh, Britain had won, in effect. And, um, and yet all these sort of, you know, the Luftwaffe bombers came flying down the Thames reaping, wreaking havoc. And, uh, and the question is, how many of these German bombing raids were successfully intercepted by the RAF? And when you see the pictures of it, it doesn't look like that was happening. I mean, can you explain something about that? Yes, they, they, were, they were almost exclusively happening at night. <clears throat> and there was really very little that the RAF could do. Um, mm. They had night fighters um, mm. and they were sending up night fighters. And some of these were uh, uh, things like the Bolton Pool Defiant, which was um, a bit like a, a hurricane, which had a, a turret on a rotating gun turret on top, which mm. had basically been, that was a plane that was uh, introduced when, when it was thought um, that bombers would come over not accompanied by fighter aircraft. This mm. was a plane that was thought you could just sort of fly alongside the bombers and shoot it out of the sky. But they were 
you know, th th they were useless up against German Messerschmitt 109s. So mm -hmm. they dropped out of the Battle of Britain and they were turned into night fighters. Also, they sent out hurricanes as night fighters. The trouble mm -hmm. was until they had radar, mm -hmm. night fighters were pretty useless. And then when they did have radar, they became a little more, a little more useful, not terribly useful, but a little more useful. And that's how that whole story of carrots, I don't know if you know this, but carrots being good for your sight came about mm -hmm. because the British wanted to hide the fact that, that um, they had radar. And so, you know, they're, they're sort of um, um, uh, cat's eyes, Cunningham, and they're, they're sort of great. They, they turned some of these so good because they had great night vision uh, and that was because they ate carrots now, it just so happened the carrots was about the one thing that the british were producing in large numbers almost everything else had to be brought in from america but the but carrots we had so to get people to eat carrots um cat size cunningham eats carrots and that's how he can shoot planes down actually he had radar um so so the truth uh, so uh, akak um the anti-aircraft fire was, you know, it was effective up to a point, not particularly, it didn't hit much, but it could hit a bit. It was really more for local morale to show that they, they were doing something about it. And, the, um, and the, the night fighters could do a little bit, but not very much. Um, mm. That's why there's a great story, um, Guy Gibson, who became very famous later on for, for mm. the dams raid, Operation Chastise. He was actually a night fighter during the Blitz. And he said, bear in mind, that the RAF had been very unpopular at Dunkirk, the soldiers and seamen, because they it had been thought that they hadn't been present defending the troops on the beaches. They then became immensely popular to the point of legend during the Battle of Britain, the few. And then in November 1940, which is only a few weeks really after the Battle of Britain, uh, Guy Gibson, who was a night fighter, was in his RAF uniform. He was uh, had a night off, he was in London and he went down into a shelter in London and he said, as soon as he went down, he could feel the mood turning and people turned on him and people were shouting at him. Why aren't you up there? Why aren't you getting those bastards? Why are you down here? Why aren't you up there? And he said he was so nervous. This guy Gibson, he was not a nervous man. He said he was so nervous at the mood down in the shelter. That he said he'd rather go back up and take his chances up on the street than be down in that shelter. So people were quite fickle. Um, and the night fighters did what they could, absolutely what they could. But, you know, there was, a, there was a great limit to what they did. And the Germans had a pretty good system of navigation mm. as well, Excarat, um, where they would sort of send beams um, that would, uh, from, from um, different points of the coast around from, from sort of Scandinavia around France. And they would send these radio beams and where they intersected would be the bombing point. They could follow the beams down. And the British then tried to jam those beams. So. Um, you know, it wasn't, bombing was not particularly accurate, but on the other hand, there wasn't a great deal that the defender could do against it. Just moving on, um, uh, a couple of observations by astute um, women members of the audience in relation to your photo about the two young women fixing uh, something on a vehicle. Yeah. And they say they're not changing a tire. They seem to be fixing the brakes and then somebody else has noticed um, and when you looked at it, it's quite clear this this vehicle had New York number plates and so this is not actually it may have been symbolic of what was happening in the place yes. something going on sorry about that that was just something I nicked off the internet I didn't really pay much attention right, right, to it. Right, right, right. It's a bit more I should, I guess, I should, yes I mean it, it really it was more symbolic than anyway. <laughs> Was just, we, that was just to get this, get, this get, talk done. We get the point, so yeah. that, that's fine. But I thought I'd just, you know, astutely spotted. So well yes, done. Yes, well spotted. Um, yeah. Now, the que there's a question. Did bombed out people get billeted on strangers in the same way that evacuees and some military personnel were billeted on strangers? Yes, yes, they did. Um, people were sent out of London and, and did end up, um, you know, in all, all kinds of different places. And sometimes it was, it was, it could be a disaster. Um, it, you know, a lot of the time it was absolutely fine. And I remember reading about, didn't speak to this person, but somebody who ended up, I think it was in Bournemouth. And they said they were made so unwelcome, so 
hugely unwelcome that they just got out. They just came home. They, you know, they would rather um, come back even though their house was bombed out in London. The, the, um, I mean, so far as uh, evacuation is concerned, you had children going, but you also had mothers, you know, going with the children. Um, but you had some, you had some terrible, awful stories. There's obviously there was no vetting mm. taking place. You know, nowadays everything would be done through social services and everything would be carefully worked out. You know, I found an awful story of a, a little boy who was sent out to stay with with uh, two two women who who beat him. A little bit of a larder. And they beat him and beat him so badly that they ended up in court. And if they ended up in court in 1940, you know that must have been pretty serious. And I found that the court proceedings and the judge was saying, you know, sending him home, back home to, to his parents, saying, please treat him gently so that he, he'll be able to forget the treatment that he's had. So, you know, there were absolutely, there were, there were all kinds of, um, you know, there, there were great, you find people who were, you know, evacuated out into the country, who remained in touch with the family they stayed with the rest of their lives and were close friends. Mm -hmm. And then there were, there were bad stories as well. And yes, people who were bombed out were also, um, you know, just, just simply because, as I spoke about the crisis in London, nothing to do with these people. I mean, you know, there's so many more people mm -hmm. who were sort of, a, you know. Um, uh, yes, Annabelle has commented in the chat, my grandparents lived in Sutton Court in Chiswick and used to take in bombed out strangers for a night or two. And Chiswick, I suppose, was some way out and sufficiently away from the, uh, from the bombing that that became a feasible thing to do. Do you know who, who lived in Chiswick at this point? Bizarrely, a large number of Belgians. Right. After, when, when um, refugees came from um, the Low Countries and from Nazi-occupied Europe, they tended to settle in little areas, different parts. And for some reason, a large, huge number of Belgians ended up in Chiswick. And they got in, they were unpopular with the local people. And I found uh, that a local politician was claiming that the, the, the Belgians were giving rise to a large um, increase in crime. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and then it was looked into and found out, in fact, this was absolute nonsense. Um, but there you are, Chiswick was full of Belgians. Interesting. Um, of course, there were a lot of Belgian refugees came over in the First World War, and um, the word is, of course, that they were received extremely well. How long that went on, I don't know. But there's, well, there's, there's, again, it was a mixed bag. I mean, you, you find during the Second World War, hmm. um, uh, you know, people again, you can't. There's no. You, it's, it's so dangerous to generalize about these things. Hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of people you spoke to said that their reception was wonderful. Um, uh, in fact, even, you know, there, there was a, a, a large, huge amount of internment. So mm. enemy aliens, tend to mean German, Austrian Jews, were, mm. um, you know, mass interned. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, that, it, it, what's interesting about it was, it was done as a kind of knee-jerk reaction, mm. fear of a fifth column. The idea was they might be sending spies in with these people. Some of these people might not be, mm. um, you know, bona fide. Um, but then it's very impressive. I mean, I think it's by July, they basically, almost all, not all, some of them were sent abroad, um, but um, uh, most of them had been released because there was a big move in the country. People saying, this is absolutely outrageous. These people are escaping the Nazis. It's mm -hmm. absolutely outrageous that we are locking them up. Um, and for the most part, they were released very, very quickly. There's a question. Um, I noticed Johnny Bucknell's had his hand up for quite some while, um, but obviously wants to speak rather than put something in the chat. So we'll open up the mics in just a moment so people can comment. Um, but one more question here. To what extent was the so-called Blitz spirit dependent on Britain's progress in the war? Oh, that's really interesting. I, I don't think, hmm, I'm, I'm off the top of my head here, but I'm not sure it is because 1940, I mean, whether, whether Britain won the Battle of Britain, Britain certainly didn't lose the Battle of Britain. Um, mm. What success was Britain having? Britain didn't lose the Battle of Britain, but that people still 
fully expecting invasion. You know, it didn't. It was it was a victory in a sense, but but mm. people were expecting the Germans to come. I mean, mm. they really were. They were fully expecting the Germans to come. Um, and th there'd been a victory in North Africa um, against the Italians mm. uh, uh, in 1940, uh, end of 40, beginning of 41. Um, but uh, but basically, you know, the war was pretty disastrous. I mean, Britain was on its own in the sense of you know, Britain and the, and the Commonwealth. Um, and America wasn't in the war, Russia wasn't in the war. It was going pretty badly. Um, and yet you do get accounts of people saying, good, we're on our own now. This is could be made today. People who uh, were, were pleased about the fact that Britain, uh, rather perversely, were pleased about the fact that Britain was on its own. Um, and as I said in the talk, I, to me, Blitzspear was kind of an organic thing. It was, certainly was uh, fostered by the government as well. You know, you had J.B. Priestley going on the radio with his chats and, and um, Churchill speeches, and there was a lot of Lot of there's plenty of propaganda. The Ministry of Information, which was not popular, people felt very patronized by the Ministry of Information. And so, the, uh, to me, the real blitz spirit, which did exist, was a kind of instinctive, organic thing that came out of the fact that people were, for the first time, empathizing with each other and sharing the same dangers and the same food and the same this and the same that. So, I don't think that was dependent on how Britain was doing in the war. I think that was more dependent on people's relationships with each other, given the situation. Can, can we open up the mic for Johnny Bucknell, please? And um, let's see your contribution. Johnny, if you unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself, Johnny? No, I'm afraid I can't unmute you. <laughs> I say I, I have no idea what I'm doing either on this. I'm, it's so frustrating. Sorry. Well, that's yes. You, perhaps you could write your question and hold it up. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I, I'll take another couple of questions while we try to sort that out, which have appeared in chat. Um, one is from Kenneth Michael Were there any iconic buildings destroyed? and not rebuilt or replaced? Oh, blimey, that's a really good question. Um, hmm, I'm sure there were. Um, well, the whole of Coventry City Centre. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, Coventry City Centre is a good example because the cathedral was, to, you know, be, became a shell, but is, you know, still there, the old cathedral, with the new cathedral next door. Um, I'm trying to think of anything in London that's really iconic that's gone. Um, I, I can't off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't think of anything. I'm sure. I'm sure there must be some some important buildings. Oh, I'll tell you. Um, weren't replaced. I mean, quite a bit of Parliament was hit, and bits of it weren't replaced. I mean, the, the I mean, you know, the House of Parliament was rebuilt. The uh, House of Commons was rebuilt exactly as it was. Um, there's a church now. What's the church down by St Paul's that was completely gutted? I can't think of the name of it, but there's a church down there which has been left as a shell. Hmm. Um, Do you think St Paul's was deliberately not hit? I mean, there's something about all. No, absolutely not. They didn't. They wouldn't have been able to. They didn't have the accuracy to right. to not hit it. Hmm. And they did hit it. You know, it was it was hit several times. Just no, wasn't destroyed. No significant damage done. I don't think. No, but it was. But there was. Um, it was saved on one famous occasion by some by a um, uh, a member of the uh, I forget which service it was, but by somebody was it was a um, uh, uh, a bomb actually in the in the dome, uh, and they managed to put out the fire and get rid of it. Um, it, it's a bit of a myth, this, that, you know, the, the, the Germans were able to pick and choose. They weren't. They, they did not have the accuracy. There was no real accuracy of bombing at this time. You could, mm -hmm. you could, 
hit an area and hope, but you couldn't rely on hitting a building or not hitting a building. Somebody suggested it might have been St. Ethelberger's that was Yes, that's right. That's the one. Right. That's yeah. And there's a question from Henry Wood who asked the initial question um, uh, and says, following on, would you expect the spirit, that's Blitz spirit, to have been extinguished if Germany had invaded? Oh, my goodness me. That's a big question, isn't it? I think that's, that's, a a, that's another talk, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> ah. I, I, w I wouldn't like to say. I mean, people always say, well, have a look at the, what happened in the Channel Islands. Mm. I mean, um, if the German, there's a, the, I'll tell you what I will say. Mm. There's a wonderful film called It Happened Here. Yes. Have you ever seen this film made in the 60s? Yeah. And it's, it's exactly along these lines. The Germans have invaded. Mm. And what they did, the filmmakers, is rather brilliant. They got there was a sort of the British Union of Fascists or whatever they were called at that time was mm. still still functioning still going and they got these people to get up in their uniforms and to give interviews about their beliefs and about what they felt and you know how they and they used these interviews interspersed in the film it's a you know it's a it's um uh, a, a drama a what if drama about the, the Germans in Britain, brilliantly done, with these real interviews of these real people who would have been the sorts of, you know, quizlings, collaborators, the people who would, who would have worked with the Germans, giving their actual impressions of uh, and their beliefs. And it's rather a fascinating film. And so I recommend you watch that, but I, I wouldn't really, I, I, it's too big a question. I, I honestly don't know how, how the British people, I suspect, you know, it wouldn't have been unlike France. You know, the, the, we like to think we're different, but probably there would have been, you know, a very strong resistance and there would have been a lot of people collaborating. And yes, I mean, there was also at a very high level, of course, a movement to get Edward the Eighth or the previous Edward the Eighth back. Yeah. It's a sort of yeah. you know, the royal family were going to go off to Canada, I think. And that was the That's plan. Right. That's right. Yeah. The, co the Coates mission to send them off to Canada. Collaborators for, without any question. And they had they sent they sent Edward VIII. They sent yeah. him off to the Bahamas. It was a place where he could do the least damage. Yes. Am I back? Right. Yes. You're Johnny. Yes. yes. Sorry, I had to do a quick reboot. I I think you'll like this. I'll be as brief as I can. Um, mm -hmm. My father was a pacifist during the war, but joined the fire brigade, and for all the miles of wood down the Docklands and told a story about being on one of these, you know, the ladder pumps, um, manning it. And the senior f um, officer came up to said, Bucknell, we're short staffed on that uh, pump, you know, quarter of a mile down the road. Will you please move immediately? And he starts packing up this bag and the junior firefighter says, Bucknell, where are you going? And he said, well, I've been told by the chair, never mind that. And the language I will not repeat from this junior firefighter so he did as he was told and he stayed there yeah. and about 60 seconds to two minutes later a bomb had a direct hit on the pump he was supposed to go oh. to and all the crew were killed hmm. and uh, the last doodle bug in London fell on King Henry's Road our family home which is now Primrose Hill Court um, my uncle was killed. My grandfather was traumatised, but he remained a sort of Tory councillor and his name is still on Primrose Hill Court. And my grandmother was buried for something like 12 hours, came out with um, absolutely red from brick dust, was told she would never walk again in her life and determinedly hobbled around on sticks and lived till she was 90, lived, lived on her own. This is a family heirloom from that bombing. Now, oh. if you look at it now, there's not a lot wrong with it, but if I turn it on its side, this was on the sideboard. Mm. And as a result of the blitz spirit, my mother was traumatized and, and, and she would only say, war is terrible, war is terrible. And, but my father loved every minute. And he, his mm. bravery, nothing flapped him after that. Nothing. He loved the Blitz. 
Right. What an amazing story. And and that really doesn't that underline there's no one story. You know, your 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 personal experience dictated your attitude towards but it's the same with life. I mean it's true of all of us all of the time. Right. Well it's got to nine o'clock, so we'll probably have to round this up very shortly, but um, there was a last um, comment or question, and it might be that Johnny Bucknell is in a better position to answer this than you are, Joshua. I don't know, because it says, on the northeast corner of Primrose Hill, are there still signs of gun or searchlight emplacements from World War II? I don't know. I, I, say, hand, I hand over to Johnny Bucknell. <laughs> but, but I think he's a local expert. Can you cast any light on that? Um, I know that there was a gun on Primrose Hill, on the top. I don't think there's anything left of it, but I do know that whenever the gun fired, it shattered loads of windows in Primrose Hill. And I remember sort of, you know, people who lived in those flats said they, every now and again, they had to completely, uh, you know, they had, the government paid for new windows every time the gun fired on Primrose Hill. You've got it's something. interesting you say about the, about the breaking the because uh, you know the Bethnal Green disaster, which was a bit later, 1943, and that panic began because of the sound from an anti-aircraft, a new kind of anti-aircraft gun that was nearby, and that's what actually got the panic move, started the panic, which led to all those people being trampled and killed. You've got a hand up here. Barbara Luke's got her hand up. I have. Um, I was, yeah. I wasn't in Primrose Hill, but and I wasn't in the Blitz. But immediately after the Blitz, when we came back to London in 1942, when there were air raids, and we were in Hampstead Garden suburb, and when the gun emplacement on Hampstead Heath Extension, when they started firing, we were allowed to get out of bed, put on our eider downs, go downstairs to the Morrison shelter, and even at the age of seven, I could tell that by the time we got down there, any bombers would long since have passed over our heads. But mm. like some of the other people, John has described a relative who loved, loved it. We loved it. We just longed to be bombed because it would be something exciting to tell them at school. But of course we never were. If we had been bombed, it would have been horrifying. But small children are immortal. Can you remember so your parents' attitude? They know they aren't going to get killed. Can you remember your parents, Adam? Well, my father was an air raid warden. Yeah, my father was an air raid warden in Belsize Park during the war, so mm. he he saw the real blitz. Um, my aunt was an ambulance driver. And she got bombed twice, so their attitude was very different. Mm. But we were in Cornwall for the worst of the blitz with my mother, while well, my father was up here, and we started every question about after war with, Mummy, if Daddy isn't killed, will we do such and such after the war? because it was just taken for granted. And of course, we weren't the only children with no father, no, ch no children, none of our friends had their fathers because they were all in the forces. Um, and you, so you had an uh, Anderson, you had an Anderson shelter in your garden, did you? No, we had a Morrison shelter in the uh, downstairs. Oh, in, in so a Morrison shelter right down, I come downstairs to the Morrison shelter in which we had something called a guinea box, which had been bought from Harrods in the Munich crisis. It cost a guinea. It was meant to have sufficient stores to keep you fed in your Morrison shelter until you could be dug out of it. Yeah, sure. yeah. I, I was born after the Blitz, I have to say, but um, according to my parents anyway, we had a Morrison shelter at home and as a baby. And so this was later on in the war after the uh, Blitz proper had finished. Um, she can recall us having to go under the Morrison shelter and I as a baby sort of shaking when a bomb hit somewhere down the road. Um, that was in northeast London, where I live now mm. in Belsize Park. And it took me back to the beginning of your talk, Joshua. Um, this is a row of houses built round about 1899 to 1901. And uh, somewhere some halfway down the road, there was obviously a gap and two um, houses of completely different vintage, mm. sort of looking like 1950s or something, were built there. And that must have been an incendiary bomb, according to your... Uh... Or a high explosive. But but the, I noticed, I remember looking at the bomb map. I know mm. bombs landed on Upper Park Road. Yes. Um, I'm not sure where else in Belsize Park they landed. Well, I mean, this is, this is how it rode. I don't know. I mean, I haven't sort of looked into it. I, there was an exhibition at Berg House 
a few years ago, which gave some of the bombing sites around Hampstead. It didn't seem to be included, but I've been informed by people who live in that house that that's the reason why it was why it was built. So I don't know whether everything's recorded, but mm. you know, even in I know obviously the East End got it far worse than anybody else, but even in leafy Hampstead, we weren't sort of entirely you know, immune. I moved to Fellows Road in the 1960s and my father could tell me of every, every new building in the area. He could say that was a landmine or that one was a stick of bombs and the other rest of the stick went so mm. stuff and such. So it was all 20 years I, later. I think they kind of hit the railway um, lines. Etched in his memory. Mm. The railway lines were shining mm. in the moonlight and they were trying to hit the railway lines. So there's lots of new yeah. bills, 50 new bills all the way around the railway lines, which they got the trains running again remarkably quickly. My mum said you got on board a train and you just never knew whether it was going to take off or not. Mm. But you I'm are right I'm... about that feeling of live for the minute, live for the minute, because you just don't know whether you're going to be killed next week. And I'm interested, the, the bell sized park shelter, the deep shelter, mm. now presumably that would only have been that would have been finished in what, 44? Anyone know? No. Because that, I mean, that, you know, that, that circular. Yeah, yeah, white thing. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that, you know, that was a reaction to the fact we need more deep shelters, but they weren't ready basically in time for anything, really. No. But then the rockets were falling in 44. They were. 45. I'm not sure they opened. I'm not sure when it opened. It opened quite late. And also the rockets. Again, I mean, you, you'd be better than me to, to talk about this. Uh, the impression I've always had about the rockets, so the Blitz was something that was very much a communal. Mm. The rockets, because of the fact they were much more of an individual thing. They, they you know, they, they, you couldn't, the V2s you couldn't hear at all. You know, the, uh, the V1, yeah. you know, the, would, would, uh, so it, it, was, it was much less of the, we're all in this together and much more of a sort of, this is the impression I've had. From, from reading accounts and talking to people, but it was much more of a fact that, you know, this one, I'm on my own with this one. I just hope it doesn't come for me. Yes, one of, one of my colleagues at work, he said you'd hear the and then you'd sit there and you'd go, go on, one. go on, go on, get somebody else, get somebody else back. Yeah. I'm still that alive. That was the V1, well, not yeah. the V2. Yeah. Right. Hmm. So I think I'm afraid we time. went to the theatre. We went to a pantomime one evening in '44, I suppose Christmas '44, and 14 rockets fell on London that day. <laughs> the tubes mm. were so disrupted and so crowded. I was almost smothered in sa sailors' trousers. They wore bell bottoms in those days, the rather big trousers, and they had to sort of pull me up and so that I could breathe, rescue me. But again, that was just an exciting incident to me. And so when you would get off the tube in the evening, were you sort of stepping over people to, to on, on the platform or were they not down yet? No, because it, it, child, child going to the pantomime, it wasn't the late evening when we were coming back, but there were bunk beds in all, on the tube stations and we used to perch on the bunk beds waiting for the tube. But they had no mattresses, just frames. Joshua, I can see as an oral historian that you're probably going to be able to go on or could go on all night. It's I'm fascinated. I, mean, you know, but I, I have a feeling probably that we ought to be winding things up now. Um, I, I was reminded, because you, you mentioned at the beginning that there was this Lucy Worsley um, mm. documentary which was um, on the BBC I don't know, a month or so ago, wasn't it? Which I, yeah. I caught up with recently. I, I would suggest that people um have a look on bbc iplayer and try and i think it. i think it's very very good i mean i would it's think just, I, it's i've worked on it blitz, i mean blitz spirit isn't it it's called the blitz, it's called blitz spirit. spirit with lucy worsley or <clears> lucy <throat> worsley's blitz spirit one way around or the other but it's it's very good and, and joshua you were the historical consultant on, on that show yeah. and um just to just to finally wind this up people were saying well you know if you were going to get it you get it sort of thing um, one of, uh, I mean, this is essentially a documentary which um, follows the observations of six different individuals um, in London during the Blitz, and some of whom I think were involved in mass observation. I don't know if they all were writing. One, one was mass observation, one was fire yeah. service, auxiliary fire service, one was the Red Cross. It's all different volunteers in different areas. Volunteers, but they've, they've written diaries and. 
Uh, one in particular was about a woman who um, became an auxiliary nurse and she was from Kensington, I think, and um, uh, had um, written down something at the beginning about, you know, oh, you know, I feel it's going to get me somehow, you know, it'll be my turn. And the husband had said to her, look, it's one chance in a million um, of uh, you being bombed. And, you know, sometime towards the end of the blitz, I guess, she goes back home and she's now pregnant. Um, and, um, and suddenly, boom, the top three stories of the house are destroyed. Mm. But she survived. She's one in a million. And then the film ends very poignantly with her son, who was a baby in the womb at that time, um, appears, uh, on, you know, because they follow up relatives of these six people. And I thought, I know him. And he's actually a local resident in Belsize Park. Um, extraordinarily. So that was a rather, and other people may know him, I don't know, I won't mention who he is because that wouldn't be fair, but you know, you, if, you, if you see it, you may say, oh, I know who he is. Doesn't live far away from the library, actually. And um, so that was a rather nice end. So I do recommend that people see that. Thank you ever so much, Joshua. That was a really fantastic uh, pleasure. Absolutely evening. Pleasure. We, dis despite the vagaries of Zoom and, uh, you know, internet problems and broadband issues and so on and so forth, once or twice, I thought we might lose you. But, uh, I have to say, Joshua was doing this in his garden shed. And he was oh, a bit more victim the civilian. But it all worked. Our all worked. It was fine. So, so that, that was, that was, that was yeah, great. Was thank, you, thank you very much again. Thank you, everybody, for coming. In a month's time, which is the... Um, third Thursday in April, uh, we're having a slightly different um, evening when there'll be a conversation between Pat Holden, one of our committee, and um, the um, uh, head of um, Age UK Camden, um, who will be talking about the um, relevance of libraries and books for older diverse communities, or older and diverse communities, I think. So uh, that'll be an interesting conversation. Um, and, uh, and then we have another couple of sessions in May and June. In June, we're getting Justin Rolat from the BBC who will be talking. Uh, the May one we'll be able to let you know about later. So again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for helping out with the hosting. Most grateful. I didn't have to do it all on my own. And thank you again, Joshua. And hope, to see, you, hope to see you again soon. I'm going to come to the library when it's open. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Yeah.